All right, here we go. Welcome to this edition of the Showcasing College Baseball Podcast, powered by College Recruit Prep. I'm your host, Ross Hawley, and I want to thank you for spending some time with us wherever you might be watching or listening from. If this is your first time with us, welcome. Go give us a follow on our Facebook group page at Showcase in College Baseball, or visit us on the World Wide Web at collegerecruitprep.com. Today's episode is brought to you by Armilla Tech, pioneers in sports communication technology. Imagine a world where every play call is crystal clear, secure, and executed with precision. That's the world Armilla Tech has created. Trusted by top coaches across North America, Armilla Tech's innovative electronic play calling system is transforming how football, baseball, and softball games are being played one play at a time. Visit armillatech.com for more information. Our guest on today's episode is a Texas boy through and through. And in my opinion, this dude is the epitome of what baseball is all about in the Lone Star State. He was born and raised in Texas. He played his high school career in Texas, his college career in Texas. And since 2001, he's been coaching college baseball in the state of Texas. He won a national championship at his previous spot, Grayson. And in his first season last year as a head baseball coach at Bling College, He led the Buccaneers to their first NJCAA Junior College World Series since 2014. He is Texas, he is baseball, and he is Dusty Hart. Here's my conversation with the head baseball coach of Blinn College, Dusty Hart. All right. Well, lucky enough to be talking with Coach Hart this morning. Uh, Coach Hart, welcome to the podcast, man. How are you doing? I'm doing good, man. I appreciate you having me on. Yeah, heck yeah. Uh, we were talking a little bit early and, and I, I always, I've got some questions I've got, I want to ask you, but, uh, personally, I kind of wanted to know, uh, right out of the gate, you, you spent 16 years at Grayson. Um, awesome. Everybody knows Grayson. Uh, you go down to Blinn. Blinn is, uh, known as absolute national power. But the thing that I wanted to know was talk to me a little bit about the difference between North Texas and South Texas. Well, I think the weather's the first and foremost thing. Uh, you know, North Texas tends to get a little chilly, especially in February and January. And early inter squads are always kind of hit or miss. And so, you know, the weather down here is just pretty much phenomenal. The wind never really blows. And it's like 85 degrees at almost every day. And, I'm not even sure if people down here have even seen snow. If they have, it's like one time in their entire <laughs> life. So uh, it's a little more conducive for baseball practice. That's a that's for sure. Yeah, yeah. You know what though, man? You got to worry about those those hurricanes down there. That's a, always a little bit scary to me. Yeah, I ha- we I've been very lucky so far. We hadn't had we didn't have any of that last fall or this fall. So kind of knock on wood that yes, sir. Uh, keeps skipping that i don't think we'll have to be jumping any tornadoes like we were in north texas yeah right? that's a fact that i hope that uh, that's the truth well hey man you guys you guys are off to a nice start uh you're three and one on the season i know you're we're heading down uh you're you i think you told me you're leaving uh this afternoon uh, yep. for the weekend three and one so i, I kind of want to lead with this um last year in year one for uh, for Blinn, you guys took you you took your your program to the Junior College World Series out in Grand Junction. That's I mean, you talk about ultimate expectations on a program is going to going to Grand Junction every year. Um, talk to me a little bit about your season expectations with your three and one start so far this year. Well, I mean, we got a good team. I know uh, we we didn't lose a whole lot uh, from last year. We lost basically three starters and really one pitcher that threw quite a bit for us but almost everybody else is back so it just presents a little different challenges you know I think this year the target's on our back a little bit and uh you know everybody kind of wants to knock you off the pedestal so to speak but I feel like we got a chance to win the national championship I mean we got we got very offensive club we got a lot of arms um we just need to play right now we dodging rain every weekend it seems like so uh we just need to play and see what guys can do and throw them in the fire and let them compete you know and that that's one thing we've always or i've always kind of prided our program whether it was grace and blend just like 
if you get out there and you play well and you you play better than the guy standing next to you, you'll play. I mean, we don't really care about your five star or if you got drafted or you know, I mean, not nobody can really live in the past and that has nothing to do with what we're doing today. And so we want guys that play for us to know like, hey, you wanna play? Play good. Play better than the guy standing next to you. I love it. I love it. Um Man, you have such a track rest uh, track record of of winning, and I know you were 2008 uh, national champions uh, at Grayson. So yeah. uh, you got more coach of the year, region coach of the year titles, and I think I think I think I saw ten uh, that you have. So obviously, there's a pedigree that you have, and and anytime I get the opportunity to talk to a national championship type coach, it's like, hey, give us the secret sauce to to what what. How are you winning at the clip that you're winning? And I know you're not going to say it's you, but it kind of is. So give me kind of some insight into when you started into coaching and you're like, and, and you, you paid attention and what does it take to, to create that winning pedigree? Well, I think I was really lucky. You know, I was really, really lucky with where I grew up and who I played for. Um, you know, I, I got to play for Bobby Magel growing up in Lubbock at Lubbock Monterey. Yeah, I think I lost 10 games my entire high school career. Uh, and then when I went to Grayson, Tim Tadlock was the head coach at Grayson. And so, you know, I was – I had some really good coaches to, to be my mentors, to look up to and to see how practice was run every day. And it's so – they're so mere opposites too. I think that's probably the biggest thing that I probably took from both of them. I mean, Coach Magel was an ex-Marine, you know, and I mean, there were days where I literally thought he's trying to kill us. Like, <laughs> we're going to die today. I mean, we ran and ran and ran and then ran some more. And then getting to Grayson and playing for Coach Tadlock, you know, he was laid back and, you know, he was a very much a player's coach. And there wasn't anybody on that team that wouldn't run through a wall for that guy. Uh, and obviously he's done the same thing at Tech. And I'd like to say I fall somewhere in the middle. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I have my moments where, you know, I just hate losing. I, I don't know how else to explain it. I hate to lose probably way more than I like to win. I know that's kind of cliche, but, you know, things are – cliche for a reason there's some truth to all cliches you know and i i'm one of those guys like if we lose i'll be up at 3 4 a.m trying to figure out what we got to do in practice the next day and it's not even that i'm mad it's just like what do we got to do to get better where can we fix this problem like where's the solution the solution and so um you know i think I don't know that there is a magic switch. I think you just set set the bar high. I mean, the bar has always been to win a national championship every year. Even last year, coming in to blend, taking over a program that, you know, had won 15 games the year before. It was just like, we're going to win the national championship this year, and we're going to prove everybody wrong. And, you know, the guys bought in. I mean, you can't – I don't care how good a coach you are – it starts with the players. If you don't have good players, you're not going to win. I mean, that's the difference between college and high school. Uh, I got a lot of respect for high school baseball coaches. You know, they, they're they the ones that teach the game. They're the ones that teach a lot of the physical stuff. You know, the more that we're working on physical stuff in college, probably the worse you're going to be. Like, wow. you want to you wanna be working on the mental things and your – offensive approach your pitching approach you know how how to uh, tunnel pitches and how to get out basically i mean if i'm having to teach you how to fill the ground ball in college baseball we're probably in trouble <laughs> that's, that's probably safe to say so like i want to i want to go and lead into this next uh into this next topic because um i i know i just from players that i've talked to who have played for you um, I know what kind of dudes they are and they're really, uh, they're good guys, but they're hard, hard nosed type players. So, so that said, um, 
when you're out looking at players, you're out evaluating players. Um, you kind of have an idea in your head what winning looks like. Can you see that when you're watching the guys and and kind of add on to that and saying, what is it that you're looking for in your in your in your players? Probably the biggest thing is makeup. I mean, we're looking for guys. I don't know how how to say it. I we can killers, you know, guys yeah. that are like they they're taking extra bases on every single. Uh, they have that killer instinct, I guess, is more kosher way of saying it. But, uh, you know, balls in the dirt, they're standing on second. The next pitch of ball in the dirt, they're standing on third. You know, um, they hit a pop-up in the infield and they're dead sprint to second base. You know, um, pitchers just – I could care less about velocity. I mean, velocity – to me, just allows you to get away with mistakes. Um, we want guys that can change speeds. We want guys that can add and subtract. Um, as a pitcher, it's never made sense to me why you would throw every pitch the same speed. So if you take a pitcher that's throwing 92 every pitch, you're literally helping the hitter out. I mean, hitting is timing. So if I'm throwing every pitch 92, 92, 92, 92, I'm playing right into the hitter's hand. So and that's one of the things we try to teach our pitchers is just adding and subtracting. You know, you throw one pitch 92, you throw the next pitch 89, then you go 76 in the breaking ball, maybe you go 80 with the changeup, then back to 92. Like there's always some addition and subtraction to every single pitch. So uh, you're really – from a scouting standpoint, you're looking for a guy that can change speeds, that can land a breaking ball in any count. Um, you know, there's a lot to be said for a guy that can throw an OO breaking ball or an yeah. OO changeup. You know, um, those guys are going to have success in junior college baseball. I mean, it really doesn't matter how hard they throw. Uh, Brayden Carmichael is a perfect example of that. He, played for me for two years at Grayson and then went to OU and ended up being a weekend starter for him. And he's those 84 miles an hour, you know, and so he, he was probably the best I've ever had as, as far as adding and subtracting. Wow. He could just really, really, and he had that knack for, it's like he knew they were going to swing. And every time they throw a change up, he'd throw in the dirt. And then if they weren't going to swing, he'd throw it for a strike. Wow. just had that it's almost like a sixth sense and i don't know if you can teach that honestly i mean i'd love to figure out how to teach that Heck yeah you, you can let me know I'd, I'd like to yeah. i'd like to have it too um man i like hearing that something you said about man that just like I, I i can visualize it i i pop a ball up on the infield and i'm sprinting i'm sprinting and i don't know if that's if that's something you coach or if that's something that's just in a kid so on the opposite side of that, are you, are there like red flags you pay attention to? So if I'm not, if you're out looking at guys or you're evaluating guys or you're listening about guys, are, are you, are you paying attention to what they're not doing? I mean, and, and also say this, do they, they always say that they, they recruit you from the time you get off the bus to the time you get on the bus. Um, can you kind of explain some of those concepts of of how you add that into the evaluation process? Yeah, I mean, the biggest red flag for us is just bad body language, mm -hmm. bad teammates. Um, you know, nobody wants to really deal with parents that are mm -hmm. screaming and yelling and doing all that stuff from from the, the stands. But um negative energy to me i mean is like the worst thing you could possibly have like um you know it just affects it affects everybody in your in standing around you you know and baseball's really hard i mean i think we can all agree that baseball's not an easy game to play so you have to maintain that positive mentality like all the time and you have to really work on that i mean i don't think that's something like i would I'm a perfect example. Like I hate to lose. So 
Mm. It took me a while. Like I wish I knew now, or I wish I knew when I played what I know now, because I gave away so many at bats because I was still mad about what I did in previous at bats. And um, but you know, the guy that makes an error and puts his head down and maybe kneels down in the middle of the infield. Mm-hmm. Like the play is still going on. You know, like there's base runners running. Like it it happened to us this fall. I mean, we had a, a middle infielder that uh, big play, bases loaded, two outs, threw the ball away. And he literally almost went down to a knee and had his head on the ground. And, wow. you know, just looking down. And there's base runners circling the bases. And wow. Uh, you know, so I mean, I do think it's something you can coach out of him because he's a great kid, like a really good kid. And so, uh, he just didn't know how to handle that failure. And I mean, we tell guys all the time, like, there's never been a baseball player that's ever played the game of baseball that hasn't made an error or hasn't walked a guy or hasn't given up a grand slam. Like, you have to be able to deal with that failure. And so, you know, we really do want to see guys fail when we're going to recruit them. Um, we want to see, are they still the first guy on the top step of the dugout? You know, and it's fine to get mad. Like, I mean, you can get mad and you can still run hard. You can pop a ball up to the infield, slam your bat on the ground, dead sprint, go slam your helmet in the helmet rack and – then you got to let it go. You got to be the next guy just pulling, pulling for the guy hitting, you know? So it's not even that I would think it's more, can you let it go? than is it is, are you going to get mad and just pout just bad body language? You know what coach? That's, that's, I love that. I, I've got two boys that right now that I'm, you know, nine and 10 and, body language is a conversation we had about two weeks ago. So I want you, the expert, a message that you're talking to nine, 10, 11 year olds that are learning the game, that love the game. How do you, how do you tell them, how do you explain that failure is okay? How do you explain that, uh, that body language is everything? What, what do you say to the nine, 10, 11 year old kids that, you know, because I know with growing up, my dad would always be like, Ross, control your emotions. And I'm like, what? I don't, I don't even know what that means. Control my emotions. So I think it's kind of shifted to body language. Can you kind of, can you, can you, is there a message you have for the young guys that things that they can work on at that age? I think with young guys, I think a lot of guys are visual learners. And, and we even do this, like I, I tell our guys the same thing, like why, would you ever let anything mm. but your play dictate whether you're going to get to go play at the next level? Like the biggest travesty for me is like you have a really, really good player, an SEC Big 12 type player that doesn't get the opportunity to go play at that level because of something outside of the wide lines, you know, wow. something that they can control. And so I show them all the time. We'll be in a meeting and I'll be like, you guys tell me if this looks good and, you know, I'll throw my head down and I'll slump around and I'll, you know, kind of kick the dirt or I'll throw my fungo down on the ground and they'll be like, I'm like, does that look good to you guys? I'm like, yeah, it's a bad look, really bad look. Well, that's why you're probably not going to the university of Texas right there. Like nobody, you know, you can hit five jacks in four games and, They see some stuff like that. And who's going to want that on national television? Like LSU playing Texas and Omaha. Like you think Coach Pierce going to want somebody that's going to embarrass the entire University of Texas on national TV in Omaha? Probably not a good chance of that happening. So, um, you know, we show them what good, good energy is. Like you tell your shortstops like, hey, after the play, don't walk back to your position. You know, just a little jog, have some energy. Hey, two outs, you make an error. Hey, give me another ground ball. I got you this time. Like, just that positive self-talk, um, which that's probably the other thing, you know, 
everybody's fighting that internal battle in their head. I think even even us as non-baseball players anymore, like you always have the doubts and, you know, your body is wired to protect you. Your brain is wired to protect you. So it 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 will keep you out of bad situations if you let it, you know, where something's going to hurt you. Like, you know, you got that internal voice like, I don't, I don't think I can do this or I don't want to mess up or that's a, your brain protecting you from what you think is going to whatever hurt you. And so you have to practice that. I mean, I don't think that's something that you can, you can just wake up one day and some people are wired that they can do that. And, you know, that's usually your Navy SEAL type guys. They, they're (laughs) wired to where, they're just – they're either going to get it accomplished or they're going to die. You know, yeah. we're just playing baseball. Like, come on, man. You know? Yeah, yeah. Like, but you still have to talk to yourself in a way. Like, you you have to have that positive mindset where it's like, all right, I just made a mistake, but I want them to hit me this ground ball right here so I can make up for it. I'm going to turn two for this guy. You know, and just that positive self-talk. Um you know, you got to win the internal battle. I mean, you know, it just, I think big leaguers are some of the most mentally tough people probably in the world because they're all fighting that battle. We're all fighting that battle. Oh, yeah. yeah. Let me, let me, that's really interesting. Um, and I like it. We're going down roads that I didn't know that we would go down, but I want to go down them now because I think it's worth, uh, you know, young guys hearing. Um, mental, preparation so I, I, what i took from what you just said is is there you said you got to practice this stuff at your level what you're at where you're taking teams to the college world series junior college world series and you're getting guys in that are elite talent that are playing you know going on and playing in the big leagues are you guys are you guys um are you guys focusing on that as well? The mental preparation, the 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 learning how to embrace the failure is that is that something you guys are uh, consciously working on? It's something we talk about a lot. I would say three or four times a week, I'll bring up something to where we either tell a story or I I always talk about the military and you know that's just something that always intrigued me growing up was you know, how guys got through. And it's kind of silly comparing that to baseball, but I think there's a lot of similarities in the mental, the mental aspects of, you know, because all those guys are the best of the best. To even get into Navy SEAL training, you're the best of the best. So how come there's a 10% attrition rate, you know, where you take 100 guys that are the best of the best to even get into the training, and only 10 people are making it through and don't, don't hold me to those numbers, but yeah. um, It's just always something that's kind of intrigued me. And I think you can take those lessons and learn from them. And uh, you know, I, I do, I do read a lot of books about that stuff. And, you know, that's one thing the Navy SEALs actually implemented was um, some mental, mental toughness, mental skill training into their program. Um, cause the answer for them was not to make the training easier. Like they needed more seals once, uh, nine 11 happened, but they couldn't just make the training easier. Right. Cause now people die. So they had to figure out how to get more people through the training. And part of what they did was implement a mental skills, toughness training into their, their daily deal and i think it jumped like 15 or 20 percent almost like a 30 percent attrition rate and that was just kind of mind-blowing to me that just guys winning the internal battle telling themselves i'm i'm gonna make it i'm not gonna fail you know just little keys like that i mean if those guys can do that i mean imagine what it could do for your baseball team obviously if every guy in the dugout is just like you know you you Oh, for five with five strikeouts, but you come up with your sixth at bat today. Can you be in a good mental space? Can you be positive? Because if you can't, you're already beat. You know, yep. you're, you're going to get out before you even step in the box. So, to me, you just have to you have to 
talk to yourself in a way that is nice. I mean, as simple as crazy as that sounds, it's not, I suck or I'm not good. Or so, I mean, we do talk about that a lot. Um, the other thing we talk about is just having a routine every day that gets you into the right, right headspace to play that day, no matter what it is, whether it's inner squad or you're playing Coastal Bend, San Jack, Navarro, McClellan. Like, it doesn't matter who's in the other dugout. You want to have a routine that's every single day. You never change from your routine. That's what helps you get into the right mental space and to that competitive at mentality every day. Cause honestly, the team that wins the national championship, it's probably the team that can go play like they're just playing in the inner squad. Yeah, you know, they, they don't press, they don't try to do too much. They let the game happen. They're relaxed. So if you do, if you work on that every day, like we're going to inner squad today before we get on the bus for Tyler. I mean, can you go attack today the same way you're going to attack tomorrow when we play Tyler and McLennan? Or are you going to go through the motions today and then try to flip the magic switch on? And, like, I don't think it works that way. I think if there was a magic switch, we'd all be in the big leagues. Man, you know? so true. So true. Um, that's good stuff, Coach Coach Hart. Uh, again, I, I just want to say we're talking with Coach Hart here, uh, and I appreciate you being on this podcast, Coach. Uh, such valuable knowledge. I kind of want to shift the the conversation for our audience to you talk about how important it is to get the right players. So obviously getting the right players is about recruiting, right, and and get, getting doing the right things out on the recruiting trail. Um, I'm curious just to start with. Um, this time of year, while you guys are in season and you're a busy, busy man, um, what are the typical recruiting activities this time of year for, for a program like Glenn? Well, we, we try to go to a high school game every week, at least one. Um, it gets a little difficult when we start conference, you know, we play Tuesday, Thursday, Saturday. Um, so we're usually at a high school game every Friday. Because, you know, high schools usually play Tuesdays and Fridays. Um, the tournaments are good. We're very lucky where we're located because I can run over to Fireman's Park every Friday and they're going to be playing Tom Ball or Tom Ball Memorial. Or, you know, there, there's a pretty good game going on in Brenham pretty much every Tuesday and Friday. Um, and we'll go to Houston. We'll go to Austin. We're, we're, very, you know, fortunate where we're located because we're so close to College Station, Austin, and Houston. So um, that's something that never really stops. Um, you know, we're constantly looking for 24s, 25s. We haven't really – I personally don't get into the whole 26, 27s, all that stuff. We've never gotten going that early. Um, you know, just – my son's a 26 at Sherman, and he we're lucky if he has both shoes tied at the game, <laughs> you know. And I'm like going, God, how? <laughs> you know, so, I mean, and some some 26s are more mature. I mean, the, the maturing process is different for every single guy. I mean, yeah. a lot of the really high prospects at that age are guys that are just more physically mature than everybody else. Um I've got multiple stories of guys that, well, Tanner is a perfect example. Um, you know, he's a kid that we've got right now that signed with LSU that was a first team All American. And mm. we redshirted him as a freshman. He was from Bonham, Texas, really small town. Um, you could tell he had some, you know, he had some hit tool like he could rake, but he was a little, the game was a little fast for him defensively. And we lit, we redshirted him in junior college for a year. Wow. Then last year, the guy goes out and hits 440 with, I think he had 50 extra base hits, um, 20 home runs, 25 doubles, just an absolute monster. And now he's, you know, by most, most publications, he's ranked the number one prospect in the country. And you're talking about a kid that wasn't even, he was a nobody in high school. 
you know. It's crazy, and, man. I didn't know that about him. Wow. Yeah, I mean, he just and we were like we were we were really sophomore dominant his freshman year. So it allowed us to redshirt him and it allowed us to let him have that time to develop. And uh, you know, he just got bigger and stronger and a lot of it you attribute to him, you know, because he took it the right way. He didn't get sour grapes because we red shirted him. He wasn't mad, you know, he worked, he kept working hard. And that's that's also something we tell our players, like, it's okay for you to disagree with us. Like I'm the last guy that is right all the time. Like we're just trying to win baseball games. Like we're not curing cancer. So it's okay, but no matter what situation you're in, it doesn't change where you want to be. Like if your long-term goal is playing the big leagues, then you need to be working towards that every single day. And me and you may not agree with how much you need to be playing right now, but that has nothing to do with where you want to be. And I think we all know which road, if you take the road, the pouty, the feel sorry for myself, the coach is an asshole type thing. We know where that road goes. Like everybody knows where that road goes. Yes, Um, sir. So regardless of the situation you're in, you keep fighting for where you want to be. And, you know, I think that's something that really resonates with our guys. And, uh, Hey, I've been wrong plenty. I mean, we've let guys go. I cut a big leaguer one year. <laughs> you know, I mean, Who was it, Coach? Uh, kid named Carson Smith. Well, hey. He was for me as a freshman, and it wasn't necessarily just him. We had we we just had a team that just didn't they didn't mesh, you know. And so we kind of decided we were going to start from scratch the next year. And so we kind of told them all, like, hey, y'all, y'all need to go find somewhere else. Like, it's not healthy for you to be here. We're not winning. You're not happy. We're all going to just start from scratch. Carson ends up going to Texas State. And, you know, the rest is history. The guy fits wow. big wins. And great kid. Man. But for whatever reason, the guys were just not on the same page. They didn't like each other. You know, there was a lot of clicks on the team. Uh, Carson probably doesn't even know that, by the way. He probably thinks we just cut him. But it had nothing to do with him as an individual. It was just the group dynamic wasn't right. Wow. You know what? That's, that is, like, there's so much that you just unwrapped right there. And, and so many things I want to say about it. Because I feel that's the beautiful thing about baseball, man. It's, it's, it doesn't work. <laughs> a set way for for every single person it doesn't work the same way and guys mature differently guys react to different uh playing styles and one of the things that i i've always found just um it, coaches I, I correct me if i'm wrong you're coaching the game because you love the game and you love helping young men uh achieve their goals is that fair to say absolutely yeah so so that's what blows me away, away about recruiting sometimes is like they see you guys in some cool dudes, man. There's some good guys out there. And I feel like the majority of the uh, coaches out there are, are, are pretty similar in, in their approach of wanting to help kids. And then when it comes to recruiting, it's like, Oh my gosh, we're, I can't ask him a question and I can't ask for feedback. And I, you want to help. So, so that's what, it, that's what I'm getting from you. So tell me about that during the recruiting process. I mean, you're trying to get it right for your program. Duh but you want to help them get it right for themselves and, and help them to have success. Is that pretty accurate to say? Oh yeah. I mean, I think we, we in junior college baseball, we see the full circle, you know, we're recruiting, our guys are recruiting. So I think if there's anybody that, that really understands the recruiting process, it's probably junior college baseball coaches. Mm-hmm. Um, Cause not only are we recruiting the high school kids, we're trying to get our guys moved on to the next level. And so we see when the South Carolinas and the Texas and the University of Oklahoma, Texas Tech, we see what they're doing to our guys or saying and actions and all that. And we're doing that as well. So, um, you know, 
I think it's part of our job to help guys get to the next level. I mean, I, I don't think it's all about winning. Um, I personally believe if you do things the right way and you, and you play hard and you work like you, we can find you a place to play, yeah. you know, um, we can't lie for you. You know, I mean, if you're, you know, I don't, I don't want to send you or, I say send you like I don't even do it like I have no control over Texas Tech, whether they sign a kid or not. All we can do is say, man, this guy's unbelievable Mm -hmm. guy. We love him, all that stuff. And then they're the ones that are going to pull the trigger. So we're a small part of that. I mean, you you have to perform. I mean, demonstrated performance. So, um, you know, I think it'd be irresponsible on our part not to try to help our guys get to the next level, you know, and, and I hope they all play in the big leagues and go in the SEC and big 12. And, you know, um, that's not realistic. Um, Cause not all, not all guys are SEC baseball players and, and that's fine. I mean, I think that's where there's a disconnect with some of the select stuff and high school kids. It's like their entire livelihood is based on if they're a good baseball player or not. And I don't think that's a good perspective. And I think you have to have some other stuff going on in your life. And, um, you know, there's plenty of guys that we coach that are going to be good doctors and good lawyers and like, hell, they'll make way more money than I'll ever make. I mean, like, and there's absolutely nothing wrong with that. I think you just enjoy the process while you get the opportunity to play and, if it's in the cards, it's in the cards. And if it's not, go go be successful in whatever you choose to do. Man, that's great stuff, Coach. That's great stuff. Uh, talking with Coach Hart here and Blinn College. These guys are – everybody knows who Blinn is. I don't even have to say anything. Um, a couple more questions for you, Coach. And, and again, I really appreciate the time. Um, I, I want – I want to – I want – specific advice for young men that want to get your attention, that want to play for you at Berlin. What's your advice for a guy that maybe you haven't uh, recognized yet? Maybe they haven't got your attention. If I was Ross Ollie, I'm a senior, I'm a junior in high school, and I want to get Coach Hart's attention at Berlin because I want to play for Berlin. Um, how do I go about doing that? I think nowadays it's pretty easy on with the Twitter and uh, with email and video and, you know, um, obviously we're looking for skill set. It's very easy for us to see. And I think it's very easy for everybody to see if you edit out every pitch. Like I want to see you throw to a hitter. You know, I want to see, you know, I don't want to see every single pitch strike three and they throw the ball around the horn like that just tells me you're hiding something almost in a way like i want to see you face a couple hitters like you know don't rush the process like um if every every clip you send is of you hitting a double like we know you don't hit a double every single at bat right i mean that's if you do maybe we need to sign you i don't know Uh, but yeah i mean i i would think a full game you know, where you can tell it's not edited. Um, We're always looking for good players. I mean, the bottom line that, you know, we're always looking for good players. Um, College baseball is in, I mean, it's in a very unique position. Like we don't even know where it's headed right now. Like everybody's old. Everybody's old. I mean, I have a couple guys that should be seniors in college playing junior college baseball. And five years ago, that was a non-issue. Like, that was unheard of to have a senior in college playing junior college baseball. Yeah. And, you know, I think I think you just have to keep keep fighting for your dreams. I mean, every time you get to play in front of a coach, it's an opportunity. So, you know, we do camps. We do all that stuff. But – you know, I mean, some guys come to camp and they got their shirt untucked or mm. we do a scrimmage and they pop a ball up and they don't run hard. And it's just like, 
Wow. You're looking for outliers. You you have to find a way to separate yourself. So if you're just doing what everybody else is doing, you're literally average. I mean, you're doing what everybody else is doing. There's no other way to explain it. You're just average. And so hmm. how do you separate yourself? You do the little things. I mean, it's not it's not something that everybody's willing to do. I mean, and so I think you just got to keep you can't take no for an answer, you know, and you just keep, and I don't want to tell you to go, you know, just absolutely bug everybody and email them a hundred times. But, um, you know, I think you just got to keep fighting for your dreams if that's what you want to do. Um, so, uh, we have kind of a coach's rule. Like we don't sign anybody without seeing them play. Um, okay. so we're willing to kind of go anywhere, but, you have to do something that grabs our attention. I mean, if you're throwing 82 miles an hour and you're right-handed, it's going to be hard, you know. Um, but that doesn't mean we won't run across you in a tournament and you're dicing people up, getting yeah. people out. But if you come to a camp and you're throwing 82 and you're just throwing a bullpen, it's going to be hard, you know. You're not separating yourself, really. So I think you just have to find a way to be different, you know, stand out. You know what? I because I know you're gonna have good advice on this. So because you you already said in, in coach we'll, 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 about five ten more minutes, but a camp I, I, like I'm blown away that someone you just what you just said someone would come to your camp with their shirt untucked. So like that to me is a controllable. So give me a, a give me some a tidbit of like, hey, if you come to camp and you want to stand out this is what you need to do to get uh, coach Hart's attention. I think just have great energy and I don't mean good energy. I mean, great energy, like excited to be there bound, almost bouncing off the walls. Like run the 60, you run it as hard as you can coach what I run, you know, just that good. And, it, and who doesn't want to be around people like that yeah. in any walk of life, honestly, like, positive energy and guys that are just radiating that they're having fun. I mean, you kind of brought it up earlier. Like we coach cause we love baseball. I love going to practice every day. Like going to practice every day for me is like going to play golf for a lot of people. Like <laughs> the, the, the years we're not very good. Practice feels like a funeral, you know, guys are open around. There's no energy. Like, that's not what you want to do. That's not what I signed up for. I want to be around people that have the same interests that I do, which is having fun, winning baseball games, playing good baseball. I mean, at the end of the day, the wins and losses are going to happen. You're not going to ever go 56 and 0, right? You're going to lose some games, but, um, you know, just that positive energy and it just radiates off to certain people and, that's what you want in your dugout. You want guys that are loose and having fun and playing hard. And, you know, that that's what we tell our guys. The only expectation we have for you is to play hard, play harder than the other team. And, you know, you got to match their energy, but it's not about being a cheerleader and running your mouth and doing all that stuff. Like that can turn you off just as much as anything, you know, guys striking a guy out and, uh, I think some of that's gotten lost, um, you know, here in the last few years is baseball is supposed to be a gentlemanly sport, kind of mm -hmm. a little bit like golf. Like if you hit a, a 450 foot home run, there's nobody that knows he gave it up more than the pitcher. And so, um, you know, I, I'm all for having fun. I don't even mind a little bat flip here and there, but like, why you got to rub it in? I think that's where the point is missed. And some people are like, oh, let the kids have fun. I'm like, that's, I get it. But at the same time, is it good sportsmanship to make that guy on the mound feel like you just stepped on him when he's down, pour salt on the wound, you know? Yeah, yeah. At the end of the day, what it really boils down for me is I'm about winning baseball games. And if you give the other team some ammunition to start playing harder than you, then that's counterproductive. So I've been in every kind of game you can imagine. I remember one year 
in the regional tournament. We're playing, I don't even remember who we're playing, but we had a good lead. It was like eight to three in like the eighth inning. Actually, it was six to three. We hit a two run home run, and our guy, he just bad flips, does the whole deal, takes a minute and a half to get around the bases. And I was coaching third at the time. And so now the score was eight to three. They get the third out. And I remember their whole team running by me. And they they weren't going, oh, man, we're losing. They were like, screw these guys. Like, we literally gave them ammunition to come back. And they did. They came back and beat us, I think, like oh, 10 to gosh. 8 in, in nine innings. And it was like, you, you never know. Like, if the guy just puts a bat down, runs around the bases and gets off, like, we didn't even give them a chance to kind of feel sorry for themselves. Like, yeah. they were just pissed. You know, they just wanted to, to beat us at that point. And so we literally motivated them to come back. And um, they got the momentum, and we couldn't stop it. And, you know, it's just one of those things. To me, why you don't kick a sleeping dog? You know, maybe he hits the two-run home run, puts his bat down, runs around the bases, the other team. Instead of running in the dugout, pissed, pissed that he flipped the bat and did all that stuff, maybe we just walked through that game. You just never know. So, yeah, that's kind of what it boils down to for me. Like, hey, if anything's going to affect us in the game negatively, then I don't want to see it. Man, uh, Coach Hart, I couldn't agree, agree with that more because I'm like, there's no point. Uh, the, the, if, if you want the attention, then you better be be ready to take the the negative attention too, because it's coming. You know, it's coming. Yeah. I'm like, I never thought the thought that was that was necessary. Last question I have for you, uh, Coach Hart. Um, for all the 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 parents out there uh, that are going to listen to this, um, I think after listening to this, they kind of get your demeanor and they they see how uh, pretty free and easy you are. But what advice do you have specifically for parents of kids going through the college recruiting process? Well, I think you got to let your kids be kids. And believe it or not, I'm going through the same thing. I've got a 26 um, sophomore in high school that, you know, he's my son. I'm his dad. I'm, I'm kind of hoping that he has an opportunity to go play wherever. And, um, I will tell you this, like the biggest separator for me has always been the love of the game. I mean, um, stuff's going to get hard. Baseball practice can be monotonous. It can be boring. Like there's, I mean, it just is what it is. Like um, the guys that end up making it are the guys that really truly love to play baseball. And um you can't force a kid to love the game of baseball. Um, so I think as a parent, you have to do everything in your power to reinforce that love. Because when they get to our level, it's not necessarily a game anymore. Like you're competing every day. Guys, they're, the way they enter squad today will determine some guys getting to play tomorrow. Mm. So um, if they go 0 for 4 in today's inner squad, you know, are they still going to have that love? Are they still going to go hit tonight? Are they still going to have a positive attitude? Like I have a theory and this is completely in my own theory, but I feel like if you ask Mike Trout right now, if he want to go fishing or want to go hit, he's probably going to say, let's go hit. Uh, and that's pure speculation. I've never talked to Mike Trout, none of that. But I just feel like, there's a reason those guys always have a smile on their face. And if you think of the best players that have ever played the game, the Manny Ramirez, the Barry Bonds, the Mike Trouts, the Altuves, like they're always, they're just having fun. They love to play the game of baseball. And I think as a parent, you have to do everything you can to foster that mentality, especially when they're younger. And I mean, if you're, if you're yelling at them and getting pissed at them because they make errors, like once again, who's ever played the game of baseball that hadn't made an error? I mean, it's the only major sport that errors are on the scoreboard. They don't put interceptions right next to the to you know right next to the score on in the NFL. Um, so I mean, it's literally a part of the game. So I think as a parent, you just 
like I, I'll, I don't really coach Dalton, my son, very much. Like I literally just say, man, do you have fun? And he's pissed. He's a lot like me, unfortunately, from that standpoint. He doesn't like to play bad. Uh, but I just try to say, man, it happens, dude. You know, you, what makes you a good player is can you come back tomorrow and play good? And if you have a negative mentality, if you're if you're pouting, if you're feeling sorry for yourself, you're not going to play good. You're just not going to play good. And tomorrow has absolutely nothing to do with today. Nothing. Your fourth at bat has nothing to do with your first at bat unless you allow it to. Yeah. You know, and so from a parent standpoint, I think you just have to do everything you can to try to help them fall in love with the game of baseball. And, you know, they may not. And there's nothing wrong with that. I mean, <laughs> I think that's probably the biggest thing. Like, not everybody's going to play in the big leagues. I mean, if there's anybody that wanted to play in the big leagues, I promise you it was me. Like, I, that was my goal, and it didn't happen. And life still turned out all right. And I got a great wife and great family. And, yeah, I mean, it's just not – I don't think you can define yourself as as a baseball player. I think that's probably the worst thing you can do. Man, man. Coach Hart, just knowledge, 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 man. And it's – I sit here and I listen to you today and I mean, we've been talking for about 45 minutes and um, it's obvious to me why the guys love playing for you, uh, why you guys win where you go, uh, because it's just steady as we go, go out and do your job, uh, enjoy the game. And that's, that's life, right? Um, I cannot thank you enough for, for taking the time to talk with us today. Um, is there any, any parting words you have for the audience before we, uh, before we end this? No, I mean, I think if anything, maybe go watch some junior college baseball games and go watch some Division three and Division two, And obviously everybody sees the, the D1 guys play. But, um, you know, I think that would be my biggest advice. You know, everybody thinks, oh, I'll just go Juco. And, you know, I don't think that's the case. I mean, uh, and it's always been that way. It's what's crazy is everybody's saying, well, junior college is way better and it's now junior college has always been good. It just, there was no Twitter and there was no social media. And, you know, back in the day, junior college guys were, they were really hungry. I mean, nobody's going to play baseball at some of those schools because they want to be in a fraternity. They're going because they love to play baseball. And so some of those schools that you think, Oh, well, I can just walk into and play. It's almost the opposite. Like, no, nobody wants to live in Podunk, Texas, unless they love baseball and they want to play. So you're kidding yourself if you think you're going to show up and just – like, we we deal with that because, you know, we'll play teams that our guys, you know, think they're whatever because they're in a small town with one red light. And it's like, no, dude, some of you guys would probably quit baseball before you even thought about going to play at that school. And so, you know, I think going to going out and seeing the level of baseball and being honest with yourself on where you can and can't play. And that doesn't mean you can't play there. It just you might just not be ready yet. You know, it might be a year or two like Tanner, Tanner Reese. You know, he wasn't ready as a freshman to play for me at and he might have been, and hell, I might have screwed up. Maybe we should have played him. <laughs> you know, if I'd have known he was going to hit 440 with 20 jacks, I'd probably have played him. Uh, but it worked out. It worked out well for him. It, so. it, it did. Well, hey, Coach Hart, and I, I again, I want to say thank you for, for joining us on the podcast. Uh, and I wish you the best of luck this weekend, this season, and and we'll be watching you guys in, uh, in Grand Junction, hopefully here in, in June, okay? All right, man. Appreciate you having me. All right. Thanks, Coach Hart. Again, I want to thank Coach Hart for taking some time to talk with us today. Go give him a follow on X at Dusty Hart and be sure to go follow his Blinn College Baseball team on X at Blinn Baseball. I'm your host, Ross Holly, and on behalf of Showcase in College Baseball, I want to thank you for listening. Be sure to follow the Showcase in College Baseball group page on Facebook or visit us at collegerecruitprep.com for more of our podcasts and content. We will see you later.